This portion of TV Confidential is brought to us by our friends at Front Porch Realty Group, the community of realtors in the Northern Bay Area of California that is committed to finding the solution that is best for their clients. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or looking to sell or lease your property in Northern California, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com for more information on how they can help you. Hi, this is David Frankham, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Robertson, welcoming you back to TV Confidential, a radio talk show about television. That is pleased to welcome as our guest this hour, Ms. Julie Adams. Many of you know Julie as the intrepid scientist Kay Lawrence in one of the most famous horror movies of all time, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And yet, that movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, is, is just one chapter, literally. It's just one chapter, not only in her life, but in her book, which has just come out called The Lucky Southern Star, the Lucky Southern Star Reflections from the Black Lagoon. It is the story of Julie's life and career, not only on film, but also stage and television. It is a career that not only spans the golden age of Hollywood, but also the golden age of television. And it's a career that saw her work with some of the biggest names the industry has ever known. People like Jimmy Stewart, Rock Hudson, Andy Griffith, Angela Lansbury, Barbara Stanwyck, John Wayne, Milton Berle, Elvis Presley, and Raymond Burr. And if you love film and television history, as I say, you're going to love Julie's book, The Lucky Southern Star. We'll tell you where you can find The Lucky Southern Star in just a second. First, Julie Adams, welcome to TV Confidential. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Also <laughs> with us is Julie's co-author and her son, Mitchell Danton. Mitchell not only co-authored The Lucky Southern Star, he is an Emmy award-winning film editor who has worked on such film and television productions as Saving Grace, Christie, Beverly Hills 90210, Dawson's Creek, In Plain Sight, Survivor, and the ABC miniseries, The Path to 9-11. Mitch, good to have you on the program as well. It's nice to be here, Ed. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Julie, got to ask you, I mean, you when, when you did Creature from the Black Lagoon, you know, 50-something years from, did you have any clue that the movie would take off the way it did? None whatsoever. I thought... When they assign this movie to me, you know, that's what we, uh, contract players at Universal, you say, you finish something, and you say, well, what's the next assignment? And they said, I thought, creature from the, what, what, what is this? And then I thought, oh, well, it might be fun. <laughs> and uh, it was, it, it was fun to make it. And I was not one to make trouble about, you know, saying, oh, no, I don't want to do this or something. So, uh, and it turned out to be, a delightful experience. We had a wonderful director, and the script was very, was very, very good script. And it turned out to be a great favorite with fans. <laughs> when did you realize that this was not just another movie? This was a movie that that was going to maybe not live on fifty years, but live <laughs> on beyond the average box office run. Well, it took a while, really. Uh, they sent us on tour, you know, to promote mm -hmm. things, and so we went out on tour, and then. I was surprised at the number of people who showed up to see it all everywhere. And then it began to, to grow. And I thought, hey, I think we've got a hit on our hands. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, 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 of course, we are mentioning before we started recording, some members of our audience are old enough to actually have seen it on the big screen when it first came out. But for, uh, for people such as myself, we discovered it either on Creature Features or the Saturday Monster Movie, you know, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and now it's available on DVD. So it's continuing to reach new viewers. Uh, it's amazing, really. Uh, I've, I've been, there was one autograph show that I was at, and there was a man there with his little girl, rather small. They were getting a picture from the from Creature, and um, and I said, well, isn't she sort of scared when she sees the movie? This little, and he said, oh, no, he said, she plays Creature in the bathroom. <laughs> So it, it has a widespread audience. <laughs> it, it has a widespread audience, although interestingly <laughs> enough, 
um, that movie was not necessarily the inspiration for why you and Mitch wrote this book. It was, it was a movie you did with Tony Curtis, right? Yes, it was Six Bridges to Cross with Tony Curtis and Sal Mineo. This was in March of 2009. We were in the lobby of the Egyptian Theater for, I believe, it was an American Cinematheque screening. Mm -hmm. And a fan came up while we were waiting for popcorn in the famed uh, auditorium there just outside the screening. And she signed the creature poster. And then he said, Miss Adams, do you have a memoir? And we didn't at that time, but as I drove home that night, I thought, you know, if, if this fan wants a memoir, perhaps more do, and perhaps many more. And as we're finding to our uh, delight, it turns out to be true. Now that we've written it, many fans are loving the book and enjoying it uh, now that they're reading it, at, that we've got it all done. Well, and we mentioned a little bit in our open. It not only tells the story of your career in, in film and television, but you really give readers a sense of what it was like to uh, be a contract player in the last days of the studio system, and, and also an appreciation for, for the careers and the contributions of many of the people behind the scenes that you worked with. So if, if you love history, or especially if you love film and television, and that's something I, I understand that you've, you've always been someone who appreciates history. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> of the, uh, I'm, I've always read uh, biographies and autobiographies of, of uh, people in, in, the sh in show business. And all from the theater and also of film. And uh, I've always loved that. And uh, as you know, there was one film that I worked with some of the silent screen stars. Right. <laughs> you know yeah, right. Uh, Frank, uh, Francis X. Bushman. Get, yes. I forget the picture, but yes. that was Hollywood Story. Hollywood Story. That, was, that was one of your first ones. And That's right, yes. We did have a screening of that as well. And uh, Francis X. Bushman and. They, they made a cameo, and when Mom was an ingenue, she got to meet these legends that had actually made the jump from silence to the talkies. So in the course of our book, we've managed to literally at least touch upon silent movies all the way up to her working on Lost and CSI New York. So that spans, gosh, it has to be 70 or 80 years, the, the storyline <laughs> to some extent. Well, one of the cool things I love about your book is that in, in your early days, you know, uh, growing up in Arkansas and then later in, in Waterloo, Iowa, you, you talk about how you, how, how like so many people, you spent your Saturday afternoons at the picture show and you would see people like Jimmy Stewart and, and John Wayne. How did it feel to maybe five, ten years later be working with the likes of Jimmy Stewart? Oh, uh, well, it was uh, a great thrill, a great thrill. And, uh, and the kind of man that he that he was was uh, so special and and I learned so much um, I think I told in my book that uh, um, one day we were doing a scene I was in the back of a covered wagon and he was standing there and we were having this little conversation bend at the river mm -hmm. and we did the two shot and then we turned and they did his close-up first of course and I was watching I was acting with him but I was also watching him and I thought how does he do that? He's not, quote, doing anything, but everything is there. So it was like a great lesson in screen acting right there before me. Not, 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 only, not only does he, you know, uh, less is more, is, is, uh, pops into my head when I think of Jimmy Stewart, but just um, the way he just carried himself. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we talk about this on the program. You talk about this in The Lucky Southern Star. The mm -hmm. lead sets the tone on any production. Yes. And, and when, when you have someone who, uh, who has this commanding, pre I mean, he has a commanding presence, but he doesn't throw his weight around. That just makes, that, that, that just, that, that just makes it easier for everybody, especially if you're, you know, especially if you're doing something on, like, like television, where you have to work at a much quicker pace than you would do in motion pictures. Yes, absolutely. No, the star does indeed set the tone. And uh, the same thing was true with, uh, with John Wayne. John Wayne, every, everything on the set was lovely. He was just so easy to work with, a charming man. And uh, they do. It, it, it does set the tone. Mm -hmm. you st okay, you started with John Wayne in McHugh. McHugh is one of the many movies you talk about in The Lucky Southern Star, the story of Julie's life and career in film, stage, and television. And you can order The Lucky Southern Star 
uh, by going to Julie's website, which is julieadams.biz, www.julieadams.biz. While we're on the subject Biz of, is spelled B-I-Z. B-I-Z. <laughs> B-I-Z. Julieadams.biz. Yes, there you go. Um, the, the, the photographs alone are they're spectacular, many of which have never been published before. So it's just it's, if you love film and television history, if you love Creature from the Black Lagoon, you've got to get a copy of Julie's book. Now, it's it's funny. We're talking about you know the the bump bump uh, you know the, the the famous. There's a there's a photo uh, as you open that chapter of you doing the back stroke and then you've got yes, Raku, you know <laughs> about to, and when I saw it, I was thinking that just reminded me of the opening of Jaws, and apparently there's a connection between Creature and Spielberg. Well, we. Uh we certainly claim that, <laughs> certainly, because uh, I don't know that he ever said so, but certainly there's a great similarity in the beginning, uh, the way he opened Jaws to our picture. So, well, I would, I, 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 I would think so because, uh, or at least paid homage to it. You know? let's, let's say homage. That, that's, right, that's, right. Yes, that's, that's, that's a little more polite. Yes, that is, it is. Um, <laughs> because uh, he, uh, he cut his teeth at, at Universal, so mm-hmm. he, he certainly he would have he, he would have known the history of of the studio and had a, and had an appreciation for that and. Well, while putting his own spin on thing, you know, you always there, there there are things that you always draw from. You know, whether you're a filmmaker, whether you're a writer, you always learn from the best. So, got to ask you, uh, the swimsuit, <laughs> the famous white swimsuit. Might, might there be a copy in your uh, in your private collection, or wh- whatever happened to that? Well, everybody always asks me that, and I always say it went the way of all latex. <laughs> 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 It doesn't last forever, but it was the one and only time that I've had a custom-made bathing suit. They made that. They, the uh, Rosemary O'Dell uh, designed the suit, and they made it in wardrobe and made several copies, of course, for the double and also for me, you know, just in case anything happened to it. And um, it's become sort of iconic. I mean, people really uh, love that bathing suit. and. Well, especially because you know back back then that was considered kind of you know risque for for mid nineteen fifties. A little racy, yes. yes. They had little sort of things that pulled the leg up the, the, on the leg. It was a little high, yeah, <laughs> higher than usual, and uh, so on. But uh, it was it was nothing naughty about it. It was just. Uh, I don't know. Well, it, um, <laughs> it was it was it was risque, but it was tasteful. Yes. But and and just when you might think uh, one thing, you know, because well, that, that's one of the things why why Creature is such a great classic horror movie because just when you think okay, th- there might be romance or something like that, there's you know there's there's always that ominous sense of danger just around yes. the corner. Bum, 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 bum. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is it about that film that people still love? Well, I think because it's a. It's a really good story, and it's very well directed, and and it does have suspense. And as a kid, when I went to the movies, I love scary movies. I love movies that you sat there and were, oh, what's going to happen next? Oh, go, don't let her, don't let her get get taken away by this creature, whatever, whether whether it was Frankenstein mm-hmm. or the Wolf, or whatever. And I think that is sort of a universal thing with people. That we love this, we love to be sort of scared, and then for it all to work out all right, and uh, so I think it's a classic form. You mentioned in the Lucky Southern Star that there's talk about maybe doing an update of Creature from the Black Lagoon. I'm of two minds of that. I, I on the one hand, I, I believe that any story can be redone. It just depends on execution, but. When you've got something like that, which is a classic, okay, you can you can make it louder. You can always improve on the special effects, but you cannot recreate charm. And there's a charm to that film that I, I think you just is best left. Some things are best left alone. <laughs> well, I feel the same way. I I thank you for the word charm. Yeah. You know that it does have a charm. This b- picture, and also that we have uh, an empathy for the creature. You know, it's yeah. not just a horrible thing uh, that we have. We feel for the creature, and and I think that's a a lovely touch to the whole picture. Well, it harkens back to that era where horror movies they le- they left a lot to the to the moviegoers' imagination. I mm-hmm. mean, they didn't, mm-hmm. you know, they hinted at things. 
Yes. Um, they, they weren't as graphic as, as they have been over the last – and, and just because just you can show gore doesn't mean you should. I mean some, sometimes just the, the sense that something freaky is coming around the corner is much more effective. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and gore was very overdone for quite a while. And, uh, no, I, I agree com- with that uh, because I think the suspense and also the wonderful touch that, uh, that people feel for the creature, you know, that they feel for this, this being, you know. Uh, w- after all, we invaded his territory. Yeah. And, and he didn't come out of the water and go seeking to kill people mm-hmm. and so on. No, no, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's a very human emotion for an amphibian. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. What are these? What are these odd-looking creatures doing yeah. here? You know, yeah. right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and again, it harkens back to classics like Frankenstein, where even where, and, and again, it, you know, people don't always give Karloff his due as an oh, actor because oh. it's, it's very difficult to convey sympathy and emotion when you've got all that stuff. That's on. right. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, I when I was a kid, I I, I I loved the Frankenstein movie. I loved it. I was scared. Sometimes I remember. I think I got down and would look between the seats when I got scared. Yeah. So I only saw a little bit of it, but I loved it. <laughs> you know, and we love to be scared in movies, really. <laughs> well, we love to be scared in movies, and and again, you capture not only what it was like to make the film, but just why why. Viewers continue to discover the film today, that being The Creature from the Black Lagoon, which is one of the stories in the Lucky Southern Star Reflections from the Black Lagoon, the life and career of Julie Adams. It is a remarkable story, and as I say, if you love film and television history, not only uh, stories about some of the classic movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, but a lot of shows, uh, television shows in in particular, that uh, for one reason or another either aren't in circulation or just aren't talked about. And again, you worked on virtually every major show that was on the air in, in the 60s, 70s, and, and, and 80s. And so a lot of great stories about film and television. Another thing that I, you know, that just comes across in your book, Julie, is Mitch was talking about just the various people that go to fan conventions. And there's a wonderful sense of community that, at these places. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do for a living or what your backstory is. You, you have something in common, whether it's a love or creature from the Black Lagoon or just monster movies in general, and you embrace that. I mean, because it's like it's, it is uh, the people who go to conventions, they keep not only memories of this film alive, but, I mean, you, under, you, you get it. <laughs> well, I, uh, that's the way I feel, really. Yeah. Uh, and also, I was in their shoes as well. Yeah. I mean, I have been there, yeah. and um, I had that thrill of of meeting people that I saw on the screen and working with them and so on. And, and uh, I, I don't know. I think we're in, in show business, we're all in it together. Mm-hmm. The people who are working there and the people who come and see it. And, and it's, we're, we're all one in a way. I, I really feel that way. Well, it, 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 it really is a community. It really yes, is a community. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, that's just that sense of, oh, I think we mentioned this in our first segment, you're, you're very grounded. You, you never forgot uh, the little girl who discovered these <laughs> big stars on the, oh, on, on, you know, as, as you're a kid. So it's just great. We will continue our conversation with Julie and Mitch Danton here on TV Confidential. You're listening to a conversation with actress Julie Adams that originally aired in January 2012. If you're on TV Confidential, Julie Adams passed away Sunday, February 3rd at the age of 92. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life. But it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first-time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 415-886-7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, For more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars, for more information, call 415-886-7411. 
or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com. Front Porch Realty Group. They'll find the solution that works best for you. Missed a show? We have more than 250 archived editions of TV Confidential available as digital downloads. For more information, go to shop.tvconfidential.net, shop.tvconfidential.net. One more item. January 23rd, 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of television's original genius, Ernie Kovacs. And to mark the occasion, our friends at Shell Factory have put together Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition. Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition, a nine-DVD box set that combines previously released volumes to bring you a cornucopia of Ernie's greatest and most memorable hits, including episodes from his NBC primetime show, his five classic ABC TV specials from the early 1960s, the rare color version of Ernie's legendary silent show, Eugene, the only existing filmed solo interview with Kovacs himself, Ernie's award-winning commercials for Dutch Master Cigars, plus a collection of short films, and a whole lot more. Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition, is available now wherever DVDs are sold through our friends at Shelt Factory. The Beverly Hills Theater Guild annually sponsors the Julie Harris Playwright Awards Competition to discover new theatrical works and to encourage established or emerging writers to create quality works for the theater. The Julie Harris Playwright Awards Competition offers three prizes. First prize, $3,500. Second prize, $2,500. Third prize, $1,500. This year's competition runs from January 1st, 2019 to April 1st, 2019 and is open to all U.S. citizens or legal residents. All entries must be original, full-length plays that are unpublished, unproduced, and not currently under any option. Entries must be accompanied by the application form and in accordance with the submission policies and procedures. All entries must be postmarked by April 1st, 2019. To download an application form for the Julie Harris Playwright Awards Competition or for more information on submission policies and procedures, go to BeverlyHillsTheaterGuild.com and click Award Competitions. TV Confidential is available online for listening on demand as a podcast through iTunes, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else where you could download podcast. You can also listen to recent episodes of TV Confidential On Demand for free on the Listen Now page at televisionconfidential.com. Hi, this is Stacy Keach, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, along with our guests Julie Adams and Mitchell Denton, they are the co-authors of The Lucky Southern Star, The Lucky Southern Star, Reflections from the Black Lagoon, the story of Julie's life and career in the motion picture industry. You can order The Lucky Southern Star by going to julieadams.biz. And, and as we say, Julie's book is not only filled with great stories and beautiful photographs, but a lot of really personal stories about uh, working with people such as Elvis Presley. You, you're one of the few people who can say, I got to kiss Elvis. <laughs> yes, I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've had a chance to talk to a few actors on this program who work with Elvis along the way, and their experience is very much like your experience in that they all talk about what a decent guy he was. He was... Well, as you know from the book, I was raised in Arkansas, and so Elvis to me was like um, a young Southern uh, gentleman, and he had that Southern courtesy, that that Southern touch of of uh, gentlemanliness, and a very charming fellow, very charming fellow. I liked him very much. So, do you think part of his charm was that he he never? I mean, he, I mean, even though he, you know, he was a big recording star and a big movie star, he he always saw himself as, as as just another kid from the South. I don't know how he saw himself. I don't know exactly, but certainly his manner never changed. I mean, he was that's who he was. Yeah. He, who he was was this uh, young Southern guy who uh, you know 
had a wonderful singing voice and had a great career, but it, it never seemed to one of that, is this another Southern saying, never went to his head, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. William Shallert was on this program a while back, and he, he worked with Elvis. I forget the picture off the top of my head, but he said, well, I, well, I always remember about working with Elvis is that he called me sir. <laughs> and Bill said, Elvis, you're the king. You know, I should be calling you, sir. <laughs> oh, oh, that's funny. But that's the way he was. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, he was, um, it was a great pleasure to, to get to know him a little bit. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget one day uh, somebody was um, asking him about being in the service, you know. And he didn't, didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't want to, uh, I don't know. It would sound like bragging or something, and he, uh, you know, he'd, and and later uh, he sort of murmured to me. He said, "You know, when I was in the service, I I just wanted to be one of the guys." And I thought to myself, "Yeah, he's Elvis Presley. You know, he's in the service, but he's still Elvis Presley. Right. And so, how can he be just one of the guys?" But that's what he wanted. Yeah, and and, and again, I think that's just part of that mystique. Exactly. You know that. Exactly. That, that continues. Part of his great charm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, of course, one of the most charming elements of the Lucky Southern Star, your book, is going back to being a young girl growing up in the South. We, we talked before about you know, how you, you spent your Saturdays, like so many people, watching these big movie stars on, on the screen. And Hollywood was a half a, you know, half a country away, might have been like a world away. And yet you show that through hard work and preparation, dreams are possible. Well, I think so. I think that uh, young people should, if they have a dream, invest in it. Invest in it in time and in study. I mean, in trying to prepare for whatever the dream is. Not that you can go take a leap and do it, but why not have a go at it? You know, but a serious go at it. Right. Uh-huh. Right. It's, it's one thing to talk about it, but if you don't try it, you never know whether it's going to happen or not. That's right. That's right. And that's the way I always felt. I felt... Well, if it didn't work out, I will have had a go at it. And um, so I prepared myself. I uh, learned to be a secretary so that I could earn a living while I was waiting to work <laughs> in film, and I did. I worked three days a week as a secretary when I came out here and uh, went to study with, uh, I found Florence Ann Wright, and uh, she helped me lose my southern accent mm-hmm. and, and taught me the technique of acting. Really, mm-hmm. Study is part of it. Hard work is part of it, but Paul Newman once said, any successful person who denies the presence of luck in their life is deluding themselves. I mean, we're all, every now and then, we all, we, we all get a bit of, you know, good, good luck on our side. And early in your career, you're supposed to do a screen test with a football player, and it turned out to be a big break for you. That's right, yes. He's a lovely, lovely fella. Uh, his name was Leon Hart. Oh, I'd re- done a reading at Paramount. And um, it didn't really lead to anything, but they called me into uh, someone who had liked it, called me in to assist in the test with Leon Hart. So I did, and he was very nice. And what they very kindly did was they shot the two shot, and then he shot his close up, and they turned around and turned the camera on me. Which they don't usually do. They don't usually do. If you're just assisting, it's just sort of over your shoulder, so to speak. And from that, I got called in you know, for something uh, that led to something. <laughs> it changed your life. It changed my life. Uh huh. So you never know in, in, this, in this crazy business. <laughs> yeah, I think the most ironic thing of that story is Leon Hart never acted in a film, to my <laughs> knowledge, other than playing the part of a football star. I believe he played for the Detroit Lions once in football championships, so was a very successful man in his own right, yet... Julie, mom, uh, went in literally as an assistant on this test and made 21 pictures for Universal Studios yeah. in the next six years because of someone else's screen test. Right, but it's but, astonishing. Yeah, but you, it, it, it's just you, you don't know. I mean, someone, I mean, so, someone saw something in you, and that that opportunity, you know, led to you know, as, as you say, 21 motion pictures under contract, and then. 20 times as many uh, films and, and television shows 
over the years where you had a chance to work with people not only such as Elvis, not only such as Jimmy Stewart, and many, many other people who you bring to life in your book, The Lucky Southern Star, Reflections from the Black Lagoon, The Story of Julie's Life and Career, which you can order directly from Julie herself by going to julieadams.biz. Mitch? I think one of the most rewarding things about working on this book is we really started out uh, just trying to get Julie's story on paper initially and the way it's sort of grown to you know people actually reading it enjoying it doing interviews with people like yourself Ed. and one of the most fascinating things is um, we've sold some books to young girls who are you know probably teenagers that maybe at the same point where mom's story takes off in the book of having a dream looking at these magnificent stars on the screen and her taking these steps of you know, learning shorthand, uh, losing her accent, taking acting classes, learning how to ride a horse, all these dance, the hula, um, all these steps she took to become a movie star and young girls who want to be writers or poets or artists or actresses or singers or dancers are really gravitating to the story and taking away that you know perhaps they too can follow their dreams and achieve something great if they Put in the time and effort, and uh, as we say, have a little luck. Have a have a little luck, but it, and, and at the same time, I mean, everyone wants to be a, qu- a quote unquote big star, whatever big star is. But I th- I think most people would want a long, successful, satisfying, fulfilling career, which is what you have, in many different mediums. And it's a story, and, and again, it's just a story that if if you work hard and just just kind of keep your head clear and be be ready for the opportunities that come i mean you can you can you you yourself can become a lucky southern star <laughs> very good uh, i i certainly hope so thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you one thing i want to touch on that you said ed was um how she kept level-headed throughout it all which i think is one of the elements of her lasting charm with the fans i mean i've been to a number of conventions with mom and i see just people flock to her and they gravitate to the character she played and I think it's her character, um, her dignity, her charm, her class. And obviously she was very beautiful, but I think there's a lot more than that. And even when Universal wrote outlandish things like that her legs had been insured for $125,000 by Lloyds of London and were the most perfectly symmetrical in the world, instead of like sort of ballooning her up and you know, sort of reading her own press clipping, she kind of went all of those people in you know publicity have kind of gone off their rockers right. and uh, just kept working at it and didn't and never like you said stayed the course and never really you know overspent or got caught up in the highs of the career and then you know when things dipped and she needed to keep working she went and worked in the stage and just always continued to find avenues to keep exploring the acting craft and find a new audience whether it be in the theater or in television or on the big screen well, if I may say one outlandish thing, you you're in excellent condition. I mean, you look like you can still wear the uh, the, spandex, the, the spandex suit right now. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much. Yes. So. So, so whatever you do to stay in shape, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I walk a lot. I'm a walker. It's funny you did you did one episode of Andy Griffith, mm-hmm. and yet it's just one of those shows that you know, people remember. Mm-hmm. And uh, you you also uh, you not only did the one show with Andy, but you worked with Andy a couple uh, a couple other times uh, throughout your career, including once on stage in Six Characters in Search of an Author. Oh yes, oh yes. Well, that was television. What did that was? Oh no, that, 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 was, that was for PBS. It was it was shot. I think PBS. it was shot here. In, it's uh, a televised version of a play right. where they um, basically changed it slightly instead of being a stage manager they make John Houseman into the director so um, the original concept of the play is tweaked slightly for television but it literally is six people crash the party of an existing play and it becomes a play within a play and Julie wrote some interesting things about the experience of a play within a play yeah. and and uh, to me that is a fascinating section in the book um, obviously John Houseman Stacy Keach directed it who was a brilliant actor and uh, you loved working with him but oh, it was a wonderful experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, it was yeah very exciting uh, great play and a wonderful director and a very very good actor it's really excellent so 
-hmm. We enjoyed writing about that because it was a play within a play, and then Mom sort of reflected on the fact that she was working in a little studio, yet it was going to be transmitted to millions of viewers right. ultimately. <laughs> so it, it sort of, as I recall, her experience mirrored the experience of the original play as well, just working on it. That's right, yes. It's interesting, like a, a flip-flop. Sort of. <laughs> You're listening to a conversation with actress Julie Adams that originally aired in January 2012. Here on TV Confidential, Julie Adams passed away Sunday, February 3rd at the age of 92. Only got a few minutes left. We talked before about uh, your early years under contract to Universal where you were learning your craft with, with not only you know, some of the biggest names such as uh, Jimmy Stewart, such as Joel McRae, such as Rock Hudson, but you know so, so many other people behind the scenes. you worked with some great actors. You've also worked with a lot of great teachers um, on, on the stage. Who are, who are some of the people that you have learned the most from in the course of your career? I guess I learned a lot from Jimmy Stewart, you know, that was very early on. I learned a lot there. Uh, Florence Enright, really my teacher. When I met her, she was uh, working for Howard Hughes people. They sent, Howard Hughes people went to her, the young women, and, uh, and she worked for Samuel Goldwyn. And so I met her, and she, she took a liking to me. Uh, and, and so I went to her, and I paid her. Fifteen dollars an hour, so I was working three days a week, and so I could only go once a week, and then I would go home and work on what she had given me, and then I would go back. And she really got me ready. She changed my speech, got rid of my southern accent, and also I learned to act there. I mean, it was it, it, very interesting in a, in a sort of odd way, you know. I mean, people don't recommend that usually, but but she really did. Uh, so. Uh, I credit her for so much. It, it seems to me that if you're going to grow as a performer, or just as you're going to grow in any craft, I mean, you have to always keep stretching your muscles and pushing yourself to do other things. Because just because as you're not the same person as you were when you're in your 20s, your your abilities grow as you as as you evolve and, and mature as a performer. Yes, that's right. That's why I always try to keep doing plays, as we've talked about, um, because. Uh, uh, that's a great way to to stretch, a great way, um, because also if I'm doing a play in a little theater, you're not taking a big chance. Yeah. You're, you're, you're free to fall on your face if you have to. The worst thing that happens is uh, it doesn't work. But Yeah, but you, you say it's small, but it's still, I mean, you're working in front of a live audience. Absolutely, and so, if, and absolutely. so you, you, you can't, as, as, we, as we joked before, you can't say, okay, uh, do over. <laughs> no. Nope. No, 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 no mulligans. Take. No, yeah, no, no, no mulligans no, no, no. on the live stage. And the audience mm -hmm. teaches you so much. Yeah. You know, you learn. You learn. I mean, uh, of course, in comedy, they teach you. If they don't laugh, you're not. It's not working. And also, you can feel it. Uh, you know, when when an audience is with you. Uh, uh, in doing Long Day's Journey and tonight, uh, I, sometimes we would. You know, you could you could feel when you really. When everybody was with you, when everybody was involved in the play, it, it's in the atmosphere, it's in the quiet, it's, uh, uh -huh. and uh, there was some time where somebody said nobody got up at intermission, you know, but nobody went out, you know, they just sort of sat there, and so it was, uh, uh, those are the things that you learn a lot that way. That's when you know when you've commanded their attention. When That's when, right, that they're with you, yeah. that, they're with, that they're with the story, with, that they're with the people. Uh -huh. Well, we're very glad that you've been with us for this past hour, <laughs> Julie Adams. What's uh, what's next on your agenda? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm at a point in my life where it's okay. Whatever happens is okay. <laughs> well, it's been more than okay chatting with you uh, tonight and Mitch, and we hope you'll join us again one of these nights on our program. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. Actress Julie Adams from a conversation that originally aired in January 2012 here on TV confidential. Julie Adams passed away Sunday, February 3rd at the age of 92. Julie Adams did come back to visit us. She recorded another hour with us in January 2013. That conversation is available online for listening on demand on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TV confidential. The Lucky Southern Star, Julie Adams' book, is available both as a paperback and as an audiobook through julieadams.biz. Mitch Danton's book, Cutting It 
in Hollywood is also available through Amazon.com. We'll take a quick time out, then we'll continue our conversation with Jeffrey Mark next on TV Confidential. Missed a show? We have more than 250 archived editions of TV Confidential available as digital downloads. For more information, go to shop.tvconfidential.net, shop.tvconfidential.net. Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon gemstones of narrative, something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www.storysalon.com. Uber is the mobile app that connects you with a driver for immediate transportation. Request a ride at the tap of a button and you have a driver curbside in minutes. You can choose to be driven in a black car, SUV, or you can choose UberX, the low-cost Uber for a ride in a hybrid or mid-range car. Payment is seamless and cashless. Build to your card on file with no need to tip. Enter the promo code TV Confidential after you download the app to receive a free first ride up to $20. For more information, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. If you've listened to TV Confidential and like what you've heard, please consider supporting our efforts by becoming a patron of our show through Patreon. It's easy to do and costs as little as a dollar a month. For more information, go to patreon.com forward slash TV Confidential or click the Patreon button on the homepage at tvconfidential.net. Ed Robertson, along with her friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four-part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a little a thing or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for... Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes. Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle at fallagainseries.com. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our podcast. If you're listening to us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TV Confidential, be sure to hit the subscribe button. 